Hello, welcome back to Buckle Up, and my name is Rob Wilson, and this is the new Peugeot 408. And today, I'm going to try and find out what it is. Right here at the front, we have the new Peugeot badge, which is now a shield with a line on it. We have the model designation on the front. Don't see that very often. Large spirally grill going on here with uh, actual vintage. This bit isn't, this bit is. And then some more vintage lower down. We've got fake venti things going on here. It's just black plastic. And then we've got the blade Peugeot designs, which I think have now been updated on other cars to have three blades because it's like a claw of the lion, but this is like a, a saber tooth of, of a thing. So let's go and have a look at the side and I'll try and figure out what exactly this car is. I'll start with these 20 inch alloy wheels, which don't look 20 inches because of the design, but I promise you that they are. This is a GT specification. So we've got some nice black mirror caps to finish it off the Peugeot badge again on the front door. And then this is where my conundrum starts because this is quite a raised car. So it's like an SUV, but Peugeot's naming strategy means that it isn't an SUV because it would be two zeros in the middle if it was, but because it isn't, it must be a saloon, but it isn't a saloon either because it's got a hatchback, but it's tall, but it's also a coupe. Can somebody help me? I don't know what this is, but it looks excellent, I think. I'm just not quite sure what the car's supposed to be. Here I have the fuel flap because on this side we have petrol that goes into it, but there is an identical flap on the other side into which electricity goes because this is the plug-in hybrid model. But I shall go and have a look at the back and have a look at the hatchback bit of this saloon SUV coupe. Let's do that. And then here at the back, I've got my saloon body style because there is bodywork that goes beyond the rear glass. No rear wiper, which again leads me to believe that this was a saloon. I've got my lights here for my claw, which is not the same as the front ones. So a bit of mismatching going on there. And then a rather large black plastic bumper, which even on this GT model is not painted in the body color. It does have some fake vintage-ness trying to match the front. But what I'll do now is open up the boot electronically, of course. And I will sit down, but with a warning, because this black bumper does stick out quite a long way. So when it has been raining, it does get soaked. So if you are wanting to sit here and change your shoes or whatever, you will get wet trousers. Now, because this is the hybrid model, I have 471 litres of boot space. But if I go for one of the petrol only versions, then that goes up quite a lot to 536 litres of space. And I can easily fold the seats down by pulling on these two levers as well. In terms of some features that I've got back here, I've got straps here on this side, and then I've got a net. She's sat there and can hold any items that you want to stop from rolling about. There are tie down hooks in all four corners. And if I jump myself up, I can use this rather nice metal handle to open up the first part of the boot floor, which contains my electrical cables and my tools. And I've got a little hook here, which I can use to lift up and hook onto the top of the boot. So if I need to be in here, this is out the way and I'm not gonna be faffing on with the boot floor and getting even more stressed in a probably already stressy situation. There is a subwoofer under here as well, but I think what I'll do now is hop into the back seats and see if that sloping coupe styling is a problem for headroom. Right, here in the back is where the coupe-ness of the exterior starts to become a little bit of a problem because 
I've got this seat set up in my driving position and for reference I'm six foot two or 188 centimeters tall and if I sit up straight my head is nowhere near being able to fit so if you are taller this might not be the car for having passengers in the back. I do have a reasonable amount of leg room because I can put my knees behind the driver's seat. I've got a little bit of lee room for slouching if I need to but really I wouldn't want to be in here for too long. In terms of things that I have here I've got some nets on the back of both front seats. I've got some climate vents in the center but I don't have the ability to change the temperature. I'll just have to ask nicely. I've got two USB-C ports and a little tray for putting stuff in as well. The door pockets are big enough for a reasonable size bottle of water. There is a small hump in the floor here in the back but the footwells are reasonably large so I don't think you'd struggle for foot room but I think Think widthways this definitely feels a bit narrower than some rivals and that middle seat is quite hard and raised so again you're going to have headroom issues. I do have here in the middle an armrest which drops out of the middle seat which has got two cup holders in here and I've got a very small amount of through loading as well so if I was a skiist then that might be okay but it's probably not going to be big enough for a Christmas tree. We've got some Isofix points behind Zips, which is a better design than having clips because Zips can't get lost and clips can. I think it's quite dark here in the back with the black roof lining. We've got no sunroof to let light in, so it does feel maybe a little bit claustrophobic, but I think that's because I'm quite tall. Materials here are hard on the tops of the doors. You do get a bit of Alan Cantara there and some nice green stitching. I think up front I'll probably have a little bit more room so let's go and sit up there and see what it's like. Okay so up here in the front and I guess the first place to start is with a little bit of a negative especially for a taller driver. This steering wheel eye cockpit that Peugeot have going on seems to be fine if you are not particularly tall, if you're average height or below. I have to be honest, I can't really get this system to work with the seats, the steering wheel, and then my driver's display above the top of the steering wheel line. No matter which way I put the seat, the steering wheel, or whatever, I can't quite get it to line up properly, so it doesn't quite work if you're tall. I'd suggest, personally, if you're thinking about getting one, going to a showroom and sitting in one and seeing if, you, if, if it suits you. But let's move on from that because on my steering wheel I have cruise control functions on the left hand side. I can set the distance and have it adaptive if I want to. On the right hand side I've got my volume and telephone controls and controls for fiddling about with what I can do in that digital cluster. I will say that the digital dials are a little bit confusing or cluttered in my opinion and I know that there is a mode where you can dial down the amount of information that is shown but right now I've got it in its most active mode and I've got music, I've got battery charge, I've got petrol fuel gauge, I've got where I am on a map, I've got how many miles I've got left, I've got my speedo, I've got cruise. It feels like there's far too much information on there and it can be a little bit confusing when you're driving along so I would really turn a lot of that stuff off. In the centre you've got a relatively small screen nowadays compared to rivals but it's still got all of your standard functions in it so you can use these larger screen buttons. They're not physical, they are just like like their own little screen below the main screen for switching between your Apple CarPlay. Unfortunately, your seat controls are within the screen, so if you want to turn your heated seat on, you've got to hit seat options, and then you've got to turn your heated seat on by touching the screen, which isn't the best in my opinion. You've also, on this spec, got a massaging option, so I can turn that on in there. And again, my climate controls, I've got to go into the screen 
itself to fiddle around with the temperature and it's not slidey like it is in some cars on the screen you have to like aim your finger onto the screen to change the temperature which is a little bit difficult when you're driving along below that i have some shortcut buttons so i've got a volume knob i've got a, a shortcut to the car functions the climate functions the front windscreen defroster recirc rear screen and a shortcut to turn off the climate controls completely as well as your hazard warning lights below that there's a little tray for wireless charging then i've got my start button and drive selector on this weird contraption here but basically you push it up for reverse down for drive sort of half push it for neutral and there is a, a b option for enhanced regen i've then got a drive mode button which means i can select between sport hybrid and full ev electric mode if i want to below the little raised platform with your drive selector on you do have another cubby a usb c and a 12 volt socket i've also got two cup holders and at the minute i have a coffee cup in there and the bottle of water that fits nicely in the felt lined door pockets fits in there as well in terms of some practical features there's a little cubby down here which you can either put your phone in if you are plugging it in to the apple carplay or i found that the keys fit in there quite nicely if i press this button the center console opens up not very deep at all but there is another usb c in there you do actually have a full size glove box which is not a given on a french car in fact it's very rare so it's nice to see that feature the materials in here are nice we've got soft touch on the doors a bit of alan cantara on there as well squidgy materials on the top of the dash and this bit here is soft as well the design is very sweeping and driver focus the screen is towards the driver and i think that's part of that cockpit vision that peugeot have got going on one thing i will say is it does feel very enclosed in here again that's probably to do with that but from the outside the car is quite large so it is weird that it feels quite small in here as a result of those design choices but i think what we'll do now is head out onto the road and see how it drives okay so out driving the peugeot 408 plug-in hybrid i guess i'll start with the lineup of engine choices that you've got in this car because as i've said this is the plug-in hybrid you can get different versions you can get a petrol only 1.2 with 131 horsepower you can get a conventional hybrid which is a combination of that engine and an electric motor and that's 136 horsepower or you can go for one of two plug-in hybrid options they both use 1.6 petrol engines and then they're mated to slightly bigger batteries which are lithium ion in case you were wondering and you get a choice of 180 horsepower or this top spec 225 horsepower that i have in this model so they're all front wheel drive there is no all wheel drive option it uses an eight speed automatic gearbox and it has 360 newton meters of torque well, 0 to 60 is 7.9 seconds and it'll go onto a top speed of 145 miles per hour as it's a plug-in hybrid it's probably worth mentioning that the battery capacity on a wltp cycle suggests that it would do 40 miles on a charge although in my experience it seems to deplete a little bit faster than that i would suspect that you would be getting more like 30 31 miles if you were just using the battery which of course you can do with your drive modes you can select electric only at the minute i've got it in hybrid because i think that's what most people are going to have it in most of the time let the car figure itself out but you can put it in sport and then the steering gets a bit heavier and the gearbox supposedly gets a little bit faster although i do think it is a little bit dim-witted when you put your foot down initially there's quite a bit of time where it's figuring out what it's supposed to do 
but the electricity fills in the gaps so it, it does it does have that sort of instant urgency of a full electric vehicle because in that initial 0 to 20 30 miles an hour it is mainly using the EV propulsion so it does feel quite sprightly around town it's not the most dynamic vehicle in the world it does grip and hang on in the corners but the steering offers pretty much nothing in the way of feel so if you're looking for a sporty drive probably not going to get it from the 408 more likely you're going to find it in a Ford product for example. I want to talk a little bit about visibility because this is a odd shaped car as I've been talking about it's a saloon shape but a hatchback design and it's raised like an off-road SUV so what that does mean is that when you look out the back you can't necessarily see smaller lower cars they get hidden a little bit and you do have quite thick rear pillars as well so if you are having to look over your shoulder when you're joining a motorway or something like that then it is noticeable how much of a blind spot you do have. You do have decent mirrors so you've got plenty of vision there and obviously you've got your camera systems for when you're reversing or going around a tight car park all of that information is on there. I will just mention the brakes because a lot of hybrid plug-in hybrids of old used to have a weird sort of issue where the amount of braking force felt jerky even though your foot was on the same position on the brake pedal and that was to do with how well the integration of the electric motor and battery was with the rest of the driveline and gearbox of the petrol element of the drivetrain and this feels more old-fashioned in that way because I'm not changing the position of where my foot is on the brake pedal or the amount of pressure I'm applying but when you get below 20 miles an hour and it starts to go back into that EV only bit it does jerk a little bit forwards and you feel it so you've got to like modulate your foot a bit better and get used to it and you do get used to it but initially it's like oh it's not quite as civilized as a, a lot newer hybrids have become. Talking of slightly uncivilized, this does have a, a suite of safety systems and as part of that you get your adaptive cruise control and it'll keep you in lane on a motorway. But the keeping you in lane part feels a little bit like it's just bouncing you between the lines basically. It's not as sophisticated as systems from Hyundai, Kia, Toyota and other groups like that but it's more sophisticated than say an MG system. It's, it's somewhere in the middle, it's just not quite as refined and as polished as the best in the business but it isn't the worst. It's just something to take note of if you plan on using it a lot. Suspension wise it's quite comfortable most of the time and reasonably quiet in here around town. It deals with potholes reasonably well. It's not the most comfortable but as I said it's not really sporty either. It's sort of this middle ground between uber comfortable and really sporty. If you want something more comfortable than this probably look at something uh, from a sister car like Citroen where their suspension is ridiculously comfortable. Anyway, I think that's probably enough nattering on from me So I will go back and I will do a bit of a conclusion for you. Okay, then so the Peugeot 408 What do I think? Well, I still haven't quite figured out what it is but if you want an SUV without it looking like an SUV and actually looking really quite good. I mean, the amount of people, while we've just been filming this video that have come up and said what a nice looking car this is, gives you some sort of indication on the styling of it. I think it's got a decent amount of choices when it comes to engines, if you want petrol or hybrid or full plug-in hybrid. It's reasonable to drive. It's probably more grippy and sporty than a proper SUV just because it's a little bit lower. 
but I would still just buy an estate or a saloon car if I was in this bracket of the market. So thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a like. Comment down below and let me know your thoughts on the 408. I really want to hear what you think. If you want to support the channel, you can subscribe, turn notifications on, you can become a channel member, you can follow us on social media, or you can buy some merch. So all of the links for doing those things are down below. So thank you again for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.